Thank you very much. Some years ago I was in the country of Angola in uh, the city of Nova Lisboa in the center of that large West African country. And one afternoon walking across the park on the way to the post office from the little hotel where I was staying, I saw a little African boy playing like my boys at that age had played. And I said, boy, Patty, come on, stop. Good afternoon, how are you? I didn't realize that uh, whites were not really supposed to speak to the blacks. I had never lived in that kind of a culture. And the little fellow looked up at me with fear in his eyes and started to run away. And then he looked back and saw that I was speaking with a, a smile on my face and a sparkle in my eyes. And so he took a few steps back to me, back toward me, and with all of his, the emotion of his heart, he said, Obrigado. Thank you. I have never before had anybody say thank you for just greeting them like with, a, with friendliness. But tonight, with all my heart, I say thank you for letting me come and be with you this week. It's a joy to be here in, on this occasion in uh, Wolfville. I was here in 1971 in preparation for the World Mission of Reconciliation through Jesus Christ with the Baptist World Alliance. But I spent nearly all of the time, morning, afternoon, and night, in one of the dormitories and the office buildings here in the committee meetings that we were conducting in the Baptist uh, World Alliance executives. And so I'm happy to have this chance, uh, I thought, to see Nova Scotia. I stepped out of the, the uh, door Saturday morning. I thought it's such a beautiful morning. I'd walk around and enjoy the sight and see the tide maybe come in. And uh, I didn't even get down the steps. <laughs> the wind drove me back in. This evening, I want to share with you a message concerning the Glorious Commission. As we prepare our hearts to look through the windows upon the world, and tomorrow we shall be looking through some of the windows on the, the 1990s and the 21st century. That's a dangerous, very risky thing to do. And uh, 20, 25 years from now, with perfect 2020 hindsight, you can look back and say, well, he sure did miss it, didn't he? <laughs> Let me read these verses that are familiar and yet should be extremely meaningful to each one of us. In the 28th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, beginning with the 16th verse, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. <coughs> Dr. Thomas Jefferson Billers, a great and eloquent preacher of the Northern Baptist Convention as it was at that time, now the American Baptist Convention, wrote these remarkable words concerning the commission. Says he, the commission is great in the supremacy of its source all authority given unto me, great in the scope of its operation, make disciples of all the nations, great in the content of its message, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, great in the length of its duration, I am with you all the days. All authority, that is our warrant, all nations, that is our task, all the commandments, that is our message. All the days, that is our comfort. 
The source of the commission is omnipotent. Its scope is worldwide. Its content is all-embracing. Its continuance is age-long. It is great in the height, breadth, depth, and length of its four alls. Height, all authority given unto me. Breadth, all the nations discipled for me. Depth, all the truth commanded by me. And in length, all the days accompanied by me. Dr. James S. Stewart of Edinburgh in one of his books has written, in fact, he was the Lyman Beecher lecturer at Yale University when he wrote, today as never before, there is being laid upon the heart and conscience of the church the burden of evangelism. Other generations have had their specific tasks, confessional restatement, theological reorientation, ecclesiastical reconstruction. Today, the demand is more radical and basic, said Dr. Stewart. It is spiritual resurrection. It is under God the creating of life. There is therefore no place today for a church that is not aflame with the Spirit who is the Lord and giver of life, nor any value in a theology which is not passionately missionary. A church that knows its Lord and is possessed by its gospel cannot but, but uh, propagate creatively the life it has found. A Christian who is taking his faith seriously cannot but evangelize. A Christian who is taking his faith seriously cannot but evangelize. And when I read that sentence, my mind went back several years to Brazil. One morning when I had the privilege of helping to lead to faith in Jesus Christ, a Brazilian woman from one of the poorest sections of the ghetto areas of that city of two million people, and after her joyous conversion, when the Holy Spirit had given her the assurance of her salvation, she turned to us and said, as she thought of her neighborhood, but I just can't say anything about this to my neighbors yet. I must become a stronger believer before I talk to them. She pointed to her nine-year-old daughter and said, for many months this child has said, I'm a believer in Jesus. He's my Savior. And we've slapped her and abused her and laughed at her and ridiculed her. And she has smiled through it all and answered, whatever you say or do, I'm still a believer in Jesus. He's my Savior. But I'm not that strong, said the mother. I can't talk to my neighbors yet. You know what happened. She came back the next morning saying, it was too good to keep. I just had to tell others how Jesus Save me. That's the impulse, the irresistible urge implanted by the Holy Spirit. That's the overflowing joy that thrills our soul. It's too good to keep. We just have to tell others. That is what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians when he said, This grace was given to me that it might be on its way through me to others. This grace given to me that it might be on its way th through me to others. Even if there were no commandment, the impulse of the Holy Spirit within flooding our hearts with the love of God would impel us to share with others the good news of the riches of his grace. To believe in the love of God for salvation is to receive the God of love into our hearts. If the God of love lives in us, we will be characterized by the love of God. And that is the love that irresistibly impels us to live for others after the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We seek to evangelize others, 
not simply because there is a command, but because that is the very nature of the gospel. For the gospel is the self-compulsive expression of the love of God. God so loved the world that he gave. It is impossible to prevent love from giving. And in all love's giving, the supreme desire and passion is to give oneself to the object of one's love. But there is a command that we have just read. All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. And on the basis of that authority, as you are going, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the ages. Charles Haddon Spurgeon wrote, while I was meditating in private about this text, I felt myself carried away by its power. I was quite unable calmly to consider its terms or to investigate its arguments. The command with which the text concludes repeated itself again and again and again until I found it impossible to study, for my thoughts were running hither and thither, asking a thousand questions, all of them intended to help me in answering for myself. How am I to go and make disciples of all the nations? My ears seemed to hear it as if Christ were then speaking it to me. I could realize his presence by my side. I thought I could see him lift his pierced hand as he spoke with authority. Go, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the all-glorious God. Oh, I would that the church could hear the Savior addressing these words to her now, for the words of Christ are living words, not having power in them yesterday alone, but today also. The injunctions of the Savior are perpetual in their obligation. They were not binding upon the apostles alone, but upon us also. And upon every Christian does this yoke fall. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them and teaching them. And know that you're always accompanied by, we, by me. We are not exempt today from the services of the first followers of the Lamb. Our marching orders are the same as theirs, and our captain requires from us obedience as prompt and perfect as from them. So I ask you tonight, instead of thinking of this as the Great Commission, to think of it as the Glorious Commission, for it is glorious in contemplation glorious in confidences, glorious in companionship, and glorious in conquest. What did Jesus contemplate when on the basis of his having been given all authority in heaven and earth, he commanded, go, or as you are going, keep on making disciples everywhere you go. Jesus envi envisioned Nothing less than every believer being a constant, continuous, consistent, convicted, contemporary witness and irrefutable evidence of the glorious reality of the resurrection, life, and glory of Jesus Christ himself and of his saving grace. Jesus contemplated every Christian being a witness everywhere, every day, in every way possible, he contemplated Christians being evangelists as they go, whether going to work, to school, to the office, to the social or business club, or as, he travel, as they travel. He desires that we be like the newly converted postman in the Philippines. A pastor had been led by the Spirit of God to leave 
a very remarkably growing pastorate of a new church and go into a city that was much larger than that city in which he had been living because there was no other evangelical witness in that new city new to him. He began a home Bible study and among the first to be saved was a postman, a letter carrier. He took seriously these words of Jesus, as you go, make disciples. He was always going. And daily, as he went from house to house, he would ask, have you heard the good news? Do you want to know more about Jesus Christ, his Savior and Lord? And soon that pastor was directing not one Bible study per week, but 11 in 11 different neighborhoods. And during the first year that he lived in that city, he baptized 87 new believers, most of them one to the Lord, because a letter carrier took seriously the command of Jesus, who said, as ye go, make disciples. Jesus contemplated nothing less than that. He was envisioning the carrying out to completion the eternal pre-creation purpose of God for man's reconciliation with God. As Paul presented to the Ephesians, the God of grace and glory also demonstrates that he is the God of purpose who purposed our salvation in and through Jesus Christ and more than that, purposed the summing up the heading up of all things in heaven and on earth under the lordship of Jesus Christ himself. To this end, God chose Abram, promising him in you and your seed shall all the nations, all the nations of the earth be blessed and commanded him and be thou a blessing. God chose Abraham and led him to the most strategic geographical point of the ancient world, not for the purpose of lavishing upon Abraham and his descendants his special favors, but for the purpose of making known, of filling the whole earth with the knowledge of the true and only God as the waters cover the sea. God chose Abraham and his descendants, Israel, not to exclude the other peoples from the love of God, but that they might all be included. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen reviews the highlights of Hebrew history from Abraham to Solomon to show the continuous unfolding of the eternal purpose of God to bring into history the Messiah Redeemer. One of the delayed fruits of that testimony of word and martyrdom was the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Paul, in writing to the Ephesians or to the churches of Asia in the letters that we call Ephesians, wrote these words in the third chapter. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, as he said in chapter 2, that it is the purpose of God to create out of the two, Jew and Gentile, one new man, one new humanity. Dr. W. O. Carver was professor of missions at Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky for many years. In his book, 
an exposition of the Ephesian letter entitled The Glory of God and the Christian Calling. He suggests the saved are elect not merely as individuals destined to eternal personal salvation, but are, chose, are chosen and called to participate in the plan of salvation which God is working through Jesus Christ to save the world, not just the individual, to found and perfect the kingdom, to glorify himself in human history. The chosen ones are foreordained to take part in the integrating of all things in heaven and earth into a harmonious whole in the Christ. We are chosen for service, for stewardship, saved to serve in the plan of saving the world. This is the emphasis of the whole letter to the Ephesians in all of Paul's writings, in all the New Testament, in all the Bible, says Dr. Carver. In the incarnation, hear this, in the incarnation, Christ revealed himself as the creative and redemptive power of God and humanity. All the time he had been in the world, which was made by him and was his own. In becoming flesh, he entered into human life, not for a moment, not for a few brief years of sojourn, but once for all. He took upon himself our nature to become its constructive and reconstructive factor. The church became once for all the embodiment of the Christ in human experience and history. On Pentecost, according to his plan and promise, the Holy Spirit sanctified the church to be Christ's glory growing body. Thereby, the Christ is no longer only with his people, but is within them. His incarnation has appropriated them for its extension. For Luke, the gospel of the glory of the blessed God comes in two parts. In the first, he gives the account of God incarnate in a person. In the second, the Acts of the Apostles, he tells of God incorporate in a community of new life the body of believing witnesses who continue the presence, purpose, and power of the Christ. In the Gospel of Luke, the Holy Spirit originates the human Jesus. In Acts, he embodies himself in the church as the continuing Christ. In the first chapter of Ephesians, Paul prays that the eyes of our soul may be illumined by the Spirit of God to understand, among other things, what is the hope of your calling. He is praying that we may be able, un, able to understand what God's hope is in calling us to faith in Christ. God's calling of no person reaches its final goal in the individual. Each believer is called to a place and a part in the vast enterprise of God with humanity, the reconciling of all the hostile forces and hearts into a symphonic harmony with Jesus Christ under his absolute and universal lordship. God's hope in saving you and me is to make us an integral part of that symphony of the redeemed, the family of God, the body of Christ, to the end that the gospel shall be so lived and so expressed by this body, the church, that the celestial beings with superior intelligence shall be caused to stand in amazement and in awe before the demonstration of the grace and power and the unfolding of God's nature and character in the life of the church. That not only the world, but these heavenly beings may come to, to catch new glimpses, new insight into the nature and purpose of God in history and into the character of God by seeing in you and me his body, the glory and grace and unfolding and the completion 
of the mission of God in and through Jesus Christ until finally he has accomplished his purpose of heading up all things in heaven and on earth in Christ Jesus. What a glorious vision. What a glorious contemplation when Jesus said, Go and make disciples. Glorious indeed in contemplation, but likewise glorious in confidences. The confidence of Jesus in the disciples and the confidence of the disillusioned, disappointed, despairing disciples in the risen, exalted, glorified, reigning Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to enable them to carry out the impossible. Now how could Jesus trust those disciples? Haven't they failed time and time again? How many times had Jesus exclaimed, Oh, you of little faith. And you remember, one day two of his disciples came to him, desiring to call down fire from heaven to consume an inhospitable village. One day, Jesus was talking to them about the moral necessity of his going up to Jerusalem to suffer scourgings, blasphemies, death. Were they listening? Did they hear what he had to say? Oh, no. No, they didn't hear him. They were quarreling about which of them would be the greatest, which would be the prime minister, the minister of foreign affairs, or the minister of the treasury and economic affairs, the minister of army and military might. Jesus was talking about the cross on which he must die. They argued over thrones. Jesus was talking of giving his life for the redemption of the world. They quarreled about position and prestige. Jesus reasoned about losing one's life for others. They clamored for power and wealth. Jesus contemplated the redemption of all the nations of the earth. They tried to outshout each other in ambition for the military destruction and subjugation of all nations to theirs. Where was any resemblance to the spirit of Jesus in his disciples? After all, one betrayed him, one denied him, and they all forsook him and fled. How can you trust a bunch of men like that? And yet, we see the glorious confidence of Jesus in those men as he entrusts to them and to you and to me the mission on which he came, the unfolding of the eternal, unique purpose of God for world redemption. Haven't we also full many a time failed and disappointed him? Hasn't he had to come and ask you and me as he inquired of Peter as he searched his heart, do you really love me? And haven't we fallen on our face in confession and tears to acknowledge that we've been more disappointed in ourselves than we could endure. And hasn't he forgiven us and lifted us up and entrusted us with you responsibility and mission and opportunity and with power and life by the Holy Spirit within to carry out the trust that Christ has in us. But think also of their confidence in Jesus. After all, they were disillusioned. They had expected him to set up a kingdom. And here he was, a crucified God. What kind of a God allowed himself to be spat upon 
and nailed to a criminal's cross in weakness and humiliation. But suddenly they knew that Jesus was alive, the conqueror of death and the grave. And more than that, they knew that they were now facing a defeated enemy, that there is a power in action stronger than the whole hideous alliance of evil forces that crucified their Lord. And besides that, they knew that that power that took Jesus Christ from the grave was available unto them, not only at journeys in, but here and now, to help us to live victoriously and triumphantly in our witness and over all the foes of Satan that attack us and seek our destruction. And thus with the Apostle Paul they could shout, Thanks be unto God who always leads us in triumph in Christ Jesus. With confidence in the all-authoritative, ever-present and ever-living companion, they preached and suffered and went everywhere, talking and proclaiming the gospel of the grace of God. And that gospel, the power of God unto salvation, demolished strongholds of evil, imperial powers of darkness and tyranny, and took their every thought captive to Jesus Christ the Lord. Like Paul, they could say, I believe God that it shall be precisely as he promised. And if you and I are to confront this needy world of today with all of the cataclysmic changes of the recent months and of those that are coming that may be far more so in the next few months or years, and to meet the globalization and the urbanization and the Asianization of the world in the coming century. If we are to carry out the mission our Lord has entrusted to us, we too must have absolute confidence in his ability to enable us to execute that mission with triumph. We need all that organization can provide, and that is much. We need the instrumentalities that money can provide, and that also is great. We need what personnel can supply, and that is an essential ingredient. But supremely, we need what God, by the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, can provide. And without that power, all the rest is sawdust. Paul was fully assured of the ready availability and adequacy of the Jesus of today. Several years ago, we were nearing the completion of a three-year program of major city evangelization among the five million people of Hong Kong. I was there for a very important planning committee meeting with reference to the climactic event of the three years of the program that envisioned the teaching and training and development and growth of every member of the church in every aspect of Christian maturity. And as we move toward that climactic event, a group of young men jealous of the older preachers and pastors and leaders who wanted to throw them out and assume the control, decided that the best way to do so was to cause them to lose faith. And so they came to that meeting of the evangelism committee determined to destroy the effectiveness of the whole three-year program so that the people would turn against their leaders. It was one of the most alarming meetings I ever attended, not simply because of a difference of opinion, that didn't matter, but because of the glee 
with which they clapped and applauded when by a vote of one, a majority of one, they succeeded in defeating that which was proposed and for which the churches had been preparing for nearly three years. I got back to the hotel about midnight. About four hours later, I was still awake. I'd been praying and taking my burden to the Lord, but I, didn't, I had been taking it back again instead of leaving it with him. Finally, unable to sleep because, you know, I just kept trying to reason it all out in my logic and with my intelligence make plans that would overcome the opposition and find a way around it and find a solution. Finally, I got up and I'd been reading the Bible I read about the multiplication of the bread and fish, and I said, Lord, you were able to do that. Surely you can overcome that which seems so destructive and bring about fruitfulness for your glory. I read about the resurrection of Lazarus, and I said, Lord, if you could raise the dead, certainly you could raise the dead in this committee and cause the churches to go ahead with their preparation. But I still didn't have peace. I picked up a little book of devotions by Pastor Cho of Korea. And I read one of those entitled The Jesus of Today, in which he said, it's easy for us to believe in the Jesus of yesterday and the miracles he wrought. And we all believe in the Jesus of tomorrow and the ultimate triumph. But when it comes to believing in the Jesus of today, that's the rub. That's where we decide we just can't quite trust him. My mind went immediately back to that story in the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John when Martha said to the, to the late arriving Jesus as she reprimanded him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She had faith in the Jesus of yesterday, the Jesus of four days ago. He said, your brother shall live again. She said, oh yes, I know that in the resurrection of the just, she had faith in the Jesus of tomorrow. But when Jesus had rolled away the stone, what happened? She threw herself between him and the tomb and said, oh no, Lord, he's been dead four days. By this time there's a terrible stench. She had no faith in the Jesus of today, of the now. Yesterday and tomorrow, but not to me. And Jesus said, Did I not say unto you that if you would believe, you should see the glory of God? And as he talked with Mary and Martha, they demonstrated their faith in the Jesus of today by rolling away the stone. And then Jesus prayed, and notice his prayer. Father, I thank thee that you have heard me. I thank you that you have heard me. Past tense. And then he specified Lazarus. For had he not done so, so great is his power and authority that all the dead of all the centuries would have come forth from their tombs. As he said, Lazarus, come forth. The Jesus of today. Two weeks later, after an emphasis on Christian stewardship, those same young men that had come with such dreadful attitudes came before the pastor's conference and with weeping begged forgiveness for their sins. And I ask that every pastor pledge his utmost effort to make that three-year program of maximum magnificence for Jesus' sake. And Jesus did. The Jesus of the day in whom they had confidence. The Jesus of companionship and the Jesus of conquest. The commission is glorious in both. 
and his living presence with us and within us is promised. As he said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come unto you. One night in Nazareth, I'd gone to bed to try to get warm because there was no heat in that stone building. It wasn't as cold as Wolfville, but it seemed like it. <laughs> and I was trying to go to sleep, but I was thinking about the sermon I was to preach the next morning in the Baptist Church of Nazareth. And, and the week of preaching for which I was scheduled, and suddenly I said, who in the world do I think I am that I would try to preach a revival in Nazareth? It was here that they first tried to kill Jesus. It was here that Jesus could do no mighty works because of their unbelief. Who do I think I am? And I got really scared. And there came a presence as real as if I could have touched him. And a voice as real as if it had spoken on a public address system saying, you did not choose me, I chose you and appointed you to go and bring forth fruit. And the presence of Jesus, the living Savior and companion, drove away the fears. And during that week we saw more than 100 young people and adults make a public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as Savior including a school teacher, a high school teacher, an avowed communist who became one of the greatest soul winners I've ever known. A high school student, the son of a communist mayor of the city, who today in, this, in the, US, the USA is a layman whose life counts positively and gloriously for the Lord Jesus Christ. Glorious in conquest, as well as in companionship when we take seriously the great, the great and glorious commission of our Lord.